So I welcome now Gwen Gilliard. She will uh, say us something about the new therapeutic possibilities we have. And I guess uh, this is also a very interesting issue for all of you. So please. Thank you. Am I on? Yes. And this is a pointer. Okay. It is my pleasure today to uh, give you a summary of the uh, different presentations we had during the scientific symposium uh, related to the novel therapies and the work that is being pursued right now to develop new therapies for retinal degeneration and Usher syndrome. So, um, in my lab, um, I actually also study Usher syndrome, um, both at the basic uh, level and understanding the role of the different Usher proteins, and also looking at how we can use tech novel technologies to recover uh, hearing or, or protect the ear from degenerating, and uh, eventually collaborate with labs that are focused on the eye. Um, so today is um, a very exciting day for me because um, we held this uh, conference in Boston, where I am from. I'm uh, working at Boston Children's Hospital in Boston. We held this conference four years ago, and there were maybe a handful of clinical trials that were on the way. Um, but today, four years later, the science has progressed so much that we have about 40 clinical trials going on. Um, not all for Usher syndrome, but all for retinal degeneration, and, uh, and some, well, all for retinal degeneration, and some more focused on Usher syndrome genes, more precisely. And uh, this is really exciting. But the other aspect um, which I want to touch upon is um, that um, there actually is uh, the first clinical trial which started in 2006 was approved in the United States. So the drug was approved in the United States in De December 2017. And um, so when you think about Usher syndrome, and I don't have to uh, reintroduce um, um, the basic of Usher syndrome since Uwe did such a wonderful job, but as you understand, there are um, at the moment, at least we think of 10 genes which are associated with Usher syndrome and many, many mutations uh, that affect uh, the expression uh, from, from the gene to the protein. So if the gene is disrupted, you may not get any protein expressed or you may get a truncated protein, so a very short protein, which will not be functional. And what we've learned through the years is that these Usher proteins form what we call an interactome. They interact with each other. You can imagine a tree of Usher proteins that are assembled and play a role structurally and functionally. If you take one of these proteins out, that tree falls, falls apart. The sensory cells of the ear will eventually degenerate. The retinal, the photoreceptor cell of the eye will eventually degenerate. And this is what's going to lead to the deafness and blindness. So where can we uh, interfere with this, uh, with this mutation? How can we um, go uh, beyond that and restore function? So there are lots of different approaches, um, uh, many of them which are associated with... A little bit slowly, okay. <laughs> Um, I tend to speak fast, I'm sorry. And I am French, but I speak fast in French and in English. <laughs> um, so we can think about uh, what we call gene augmentation therapy or gene replacement therapy, uh, in which case we basically add more copies of the normal gene. Um, there, are, there is current work going on uh, looking at gene editing, so using small molecules or different um, novel proteins that have been discovered uh, recently to correct uh, this gene. We have a potential correction of translation, and I'll talk a little bit about that, which uh, basically allow for correct, uh, correct reading of this gene sequence, right? Like you you're reading a book and instead of reading the word with uh, a spelling mistake in the middle, you're actually going to correct that. Or uh, there's also progress looking at small molecules and using pharmacology to um, mostly to um, limit the degeneration of those sensory cells. So uh, during the scientific meeting, we had a lot of different talks um, 
on uh, gene augmentation therapy uh, by Alberto Riccio, uh, gene editing by Carla Fuster Garcia. Um, some of those were invited speakers and others were selected from uh, the abstract that they submitted. Uh, we had work presented on antisense and translational read through therapy. I'm going to so touch upon that. And also looking at. My titles are not coming in the right order. <laughs> Small molecules and pharmacology uh, with Yoshikazu Imanishi and Ala Koleila. And also uh, potentially using stem cells, uh, mostly at this moment to understand the disease and, and, and tease apart uh, the rules of just different proteins, but also um, to derive um, um, stem cell um, organoids, so basically reproduce the retina or the ear in a dish from patient-derived stem cells. So from your cells, we can learn a lot. We can put um, these uh, stem cells and force them to become a mini eye or mini ear. Um, it's not quite like your ear, but it's, it's a system that we can use to tease apart those different molecules. And it's uh, extremely uh, useful and, and we've learned a lot from it. So I want to start with this um, amazing story of this clinical trial, which is not for Usher syndrome, it's for uh, LCA, uh, which was started in 2006, and it took about 10 years uh, for uh, uh, Spark Therapeutics and, and Jean Bennett, who was one of the uh, main investigators who was involved, to go from a uh, lab results and uh, the beginning of a clinical trial to a drug that was just approved. Um, so that was approved in December, uh, on December 19th. Uh, the drug is called Luxterna, and it's um, now um, basically uh, what it does is it um, allows the um, it's a gene augmentation therapy, so it allows to uh, give back the normal copy of the gene uh, for um, patients who are affected by labor congenital amaurosis or LCA, which does lead to retinitis, retinitis pigmentosa, which is also something that we see um, in Usher syndrome. And I'm not sure if, the, uh, if this is going to work. Um, no, it looks like, oh, maybe. I'm going to try to play this just uh, smaller. We have the sound, right? Yes. Let's see if it's going to work. LCA stands for Labor's Congenital Amaurosis. It's a rare form of retinitis pigmentosa, which is oh, a it's not progressive blinding disease. You know Usually these babies show? are significantly impaired, and it's devastating because not only is their vision terrible at birth, but it gets okay. progressively worse with age as the cells in the retina die off. A dog born blind with this very same condition, so the puppies that were born blind couldn't see their way around a room, and we tested the... The video is not showing, we're gonna try to... It's not, it's pulls out uh... Yes, okay, okay. <laughs> should, should I start from the beginning? Yeah. It's only a minute and a half, so... LCA stands for Labor's Congenital Amaurosis. It's a rare form of retinitis pigmentosa, which is a progressive blinding disease. Usually these babies are significantly impaired, and it's devastating because not only is their vision terrible at birth, but it gets progressively worse with age as the cells in the retina die off. A dog born blind with this very same condition, so the puppies that were born blind couldn't see their way around a room, and we tested the possibility of restoring vision in these little puppies by delivering the normal copy of the gene, which is defective. It's called RPE65. And lo and behold, these dogs began to see. And so those results led us to propose to test this same approach for treating blindness in young children. For these individual patients, it, it's so gratifying to see what they now can do that they could not do before. There are two things that I think are really going to be important from this. One, that will move forward with this particular disease and get approval for the drug that we've been developing. The other outcome that I think is really important is that this could be a stepping stone for developing a treatment for other blinding diseases. Great. Let's see if we can go back now to my presentation. Yes. 
Well, right now, a groundbreaking oh. clinical research study is in the hands of the FDA, and it was developed very close Oops, to sorry. home. <laughs> Could the answer to Can cure a rare blindness be found in gene therapy? Say. 3 News Now reporter Shante Pasmore spoke to someone right here in Omaha who oh. might know the answer in a story you only Can see on 3. Shante. Good morning, Emily James. Sorry. Talk to Molly Troxel, and she'll tell you, yes, this should be a... <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, that's all right. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about the technical difficulties we had. Oh, okay. No, I went too fast. Okay, so um, I, um, I have about 10 minutes to go through um, the scientific presentations we had, and I apologize to the speakers who are here. I may have to go quickly through your slides. Um, but um, one um, story that we heard uh, during this meeting is actually uh, a very important progress that we've made uh, in, in the labs, uh, because one of the issues with some of the usher genes that uh, we've been looking at is that they are too big to fit into the the tools that we uh, currently have. So we have to design uh, alternative strategies to um package basically these genes uh, to re-express uh, the correct proteins. And so one um, option that, that we have now and that's uh, really becoming uh, quite, um, uh, um, work, it's working quite well, it's basically really chopping the gene into little pieces that we can package into our little vehicles and then provide them to, um, to the, either the eye or the ear. And so um, it's basically chopping, in this case, this is a, an example of chopping the gene into two pieces and having little pieces of it up, and then we can get a reconstitution of that gene and expression of the protein in the, in the cells. And so this work was presented by Alberto Oricchio from Naples, Italy, and um, he validated the use of this dual, we call it the dual, adeno-associated viral vector. So it's a virus which is innocuous, so it will not make you sick. It serves, it serves really as a vehicle to bring that gene inside the cell. And in this case, um, um, Alberto was targeting a, uh, the Usher 1B gene, which encode for myosin 7A. And so he showed that he could get the gene into um, the retina of pigs and get the gene expressed. Um, and he also showed that he could get recovery of the morphological feature of the retina. So while the mutant mice, for example, here that he was using, which are called the shaker mice, it's a model again for Usher uh, 1B, um, while he was seeing the, uh, mislocalization of structures called the melanosomes, he was seeing accumulation of rhodopsin, but when he treated with this dual vector, he saw recovery of that morphology. So it's very encouraging, and um, we, we think that's going to be, you know, really changing the way we think about treatment of those large genes, which end up often uh, being the most affected because there are a lot more places where those mutations can occur. That's the case, for example, for Usher 1B, that's the case for Usher 2A, um, and, um, and Usher 2B uh, as well. So, um, Yes, so that's just a recovery of the morphology. And, and um, the goal is really now to uh, go to clinical trials. So um, Ulrichio told us a little bit about some work that he's doing, um, developing a clinical trial using uh, a dual AAV uh, viral vector to, to target this uh, myosin 7 mutation. And they're working together with the Fondation Teleton and have a lot of participants uh, which are involved in this, in this clinical, uh, development of this clinical trial. Um, so that's one story. The next story I'm going to talk about briefly um, is work done by Jennifer Lance. Uh, she's from, Lu uh, from Louisiana. And uh, she's been um, um, seeing and, and working with patients who all are affected by a specific mutation in the Usher 1C gene. And these are patients, uh, they actually are Ac French Acadian patients uh, from Louisiana. And it's what this mutation in the gene leads to is the expression of a very short, 
uh, truncated protein. So instead of the very long protein, which is called harmonin, in this case, she sees a very short protein, uh, which is not functional, and in this case leads to retinal degeneration and um, uh, hearing loss as well. So uh, what she designed here is uh, to bypass um, this error that she sees in a gene is to use something called antisense oligonucleotide. And again, this is to skip that mistake in the reading frame of that gene. Um, and it actually is very potent. It works very well. And she demonstrated um, a few years ago that by injecting this viral vector into mice that she designed to have that exact same mutation that the patients have, she can recover uh, vestibular, so the, the mice uh, have a normal vestibular um, um, behavior. They recover hearing and they also recover uh, vision. So um, I actually worked together with her um, to uh, assess different ways to uh, apply this drug, um, either systematically or locally through transmembrane, uh, application on a transmembrane, or through the round window. And, um, and uh, she's also now working on the vision using local intravitreal injections. Um, I'll just show you this uh, quick um, uh, little video here, hopefully this time that will work well. Um, so what we're looking at, so what's very interesting, and I know a lot of you uh, suffer from those vestibular balance uh, disorders, and in the mice it's pretty pronounced. So when a mouse has a mutation in Usher 1, G, uh, Usher 1 uh, gene, sorry, um, it's uh, typically associated with a very uh, typical behavior of um, uh, repetitive, um, rotative movements, um, very active rotative movement. You'll see that here. So here in this case on the top, we have uh, two control mice. One that was injected with a, um, 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 sorry, um, um, inoffensive drugs. And then this one that was, um, sorry, not inoffensive, <laughs> uh, um, I'm blanking on the word. <laughs> um, uh, 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 control drugs, okay. And then this one was injected with uh, the uh, antisense oligodeucleotide, we call it ASO29, and then a mutant, so this is the one that you're really going to be looking at, mutant that's not treated, a mutant that's treated. And now you can look at their behavior, sorry. Yeah, so you see uh, the mutant mice are uh, really spin, you know, they rotate like that all the time. Uh, and in fact, they actually are typically a lot leaner than their um, litter mate because of that, they're very active. But you can see that the mouse, this mouse that was treated here, um, really behaves like the, the normal mice. They, um, rotating, they're moving around the chamber, but they're not doing this repetitive motion behavior. And so any of the treatment that we've done, uh, local or systemic, really led to this recovery. So it's pretty pronounced. Uh, we also saw recovery of hearing and recovery of visual function. I won't have time to really go through those data, but uh, it's very encouraging. Oh, I have to go. So, yeah, okay, so I, I'm going to have to go a bit more quickly. So, this is, um, no, I mean, not quickly, but just skip some slides, that's what I mean. Not speak, not speak faster, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> um, I, just, I just won't tell all the stories that I have, but uh, I will try to keep, keep it slow. <laughs> uh, Erwin from uh, Netherlands um, is looking at, again, the same kind of approach using antisense oligonucleotide, and this is here for sure syndrome 2A, and is validated, uh, is approached in zebrafish, and also patient-derived photoreceptor progenitors. Um, they're actually starting a clinical trial um, with a company called ProQR, and uh, they've, they've started a clinical trial uh, to target LCA, and they're um, in the process of starting a clinical trial uh, tar targeting a mutation in H2 a. Um, this one should be starting by the end of this year, so it's very, very encouraging. Um, Kirsten used a um, drug that are called the TRIDS. Uh, they target in-frame nonsense mutations. Um, so this is um, a, a typical uh, aminoglycosides, um, which in this case are uh, used that do not induce hearing loss, um, but also can allow a correct uh, reading frame. Um, so this is also a drug that's um, been very promising and importantly, again, uh, that she, she validated in patient-derived fibroblasts. So 
you guys are really part of this science, you're part of this progress, and um, the patient cells that we can get uh, to work on the lab can really bring us, uh, you know, uh, many steps further. And, and that was really evident throughout our talk. So uh, for anybody who has doubts, uh, this is really important for the science and for eventually the development of therapies. And uh, again, um, there is uh, progress with the use of these drugs that she uh, um, has been studying, and she's really hopeful that there will be a clinical trial very soon targeting Usher syndrome. Finally, um, I will finish with a short story about retinol organoids. And so again, this is using stem cells um, and using them to make a, a mini eye, um, uh, an eye cup in a dish. And again, this, is, uh, this has been uh, very informative. Uh, Mike Cheatham of UCL London um, um, reported a lot of his uh, exciting work looking at uh, the development of uh, retinal organoids as a disease model, uh, not only to understand the, the uh, disease, but also to assess different um, uh, drugs, uh, and in particular, for example, small molecules um, to, um, to restore um, the uh, maturation and limit the degeneration of the uh, photoreceptor cells. Um, and so we, there was also a story from Yoshi Imanishi um, from the US, uh, which again is assessing different molecules. He has a, um, a system for screening a lot of molecules um, on his uh, tissues to uh, really find uh, molecules that are non-toxic and can really um, have an effect on the uh, photoreceptor cells and, and then assess those drugs uh, really in the mouse. So, I will uh, wrap up by saying the future is in our hand, it's in your hand, um, to shine a light on Usher syndrome, we need you. Um, as scientists today, uh, this day, this meeting is so important for us. Um, it's so important for us to know that what we're doing matters, and for me to see where we've been from four years ago to today is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and I know when we see you again in three years, um, hopefully, <laughs> it's going to be again another story. And it, it's really wonderful. And I thank you for, for being here. And I want just to finish with the many faces of Usher syndrome. There's a lot of us, and I know I did, it's not everyone. It's just some of us here. You're not alone. We're not alone. We're all working towards understanding the disease and finding a cure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gwen. We are perfectly in time for breakfast. So, I kindly ask the speakers to stay with me here, and if you have urgent questions, please come to us. I don't want to shorten the breaks for all the people who really need the break. Uh, the break, the coffee break will take place uh, on the right side. If you pass the registration, you will come to the coffee desks. And if you need assistance or if you need uh, interpretation, please come to the help desk. We have there uh, interpreters which can help you and we have there also assistants which can help you. We have also microphones, but I would say everybody can go to break and everybody who has a question will come to us here uh, so that we don't shorten the break for the people. So. I wish you a good break and all questions, all questions will be answered here directly from the speakers.